Well, hello gentlemen. Don't think there's any ladies here that I can see. Oh, sorry, Amanda. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, well, it's nice to be here. It's nice to see everyone. First time for a long time. So, uh, I'll get on with it. So, tonight, it's my pleasure to talk a bit about the proposed changes to our licensing arrangement that the ACMA is um, talking about. I'll just go through the main points of the consultation document, which is, if you haven't seen it, a quite a lengthy document here. It's 30, some 37 pages, and it's quite detailed reading. We'll look at some of the questions and issues that that um, document raises. I'll talk about some options for you having your say in in um, what might happen, and then if there's any questions, we'll we'll proceed with that. So, as a recap, you might recall in April 2021, I gave a, well thereabouts anyway, I gave a similar talk talking about the then new proposal, sorry, sorry. I'll stand over here, yep, uh, talking about the new pro newly proposed idea, well, the idea of a class license. It wasn't the first time it had come up, but it was some years before when it was initially thought about, and then the ACMA got serious about it. Uh, for a variety of reasons. The, from the ACMA's point of view, their purpose was to reduce the regulatory burden and cost pressures on the amateur service for, li for licensees in the amateur service. Uh, the result of that particular round of consultation was some 800 uh, responses, which the ACMA certainly didn't expect. And, but the, the overwhelming number of those were the responses were prepared to accept a class license subject to uh, an appropriate document, an appropriate class license with having a whole lot of issues addressed. So that has happened and now we're in part two of this process with the intent that the ACMA wants to introduce, introduce a class license for the amateur service probably in July next year. Anyway, so that, that's the, the background and the recap. What I'm going to tell, talk about tonight, talk about some my views and uh, they uh, reflect my interests and my understanding of the situation. So they might be different to yours, and we can talk about that uh, if anyone wants to. So as I said, the general idea is to simplify the amateur license conditions, to remove obsolete, duplicated, or redundant text from the existing licen license conditions, which is an apparatus license. There's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, it'll provide a license for life, more or less, at uh, minimal cost. However, it's worth noting that things like beacons and repeaters will still be licensed under the existing apparatus licensing scheme, subject to a payment. So that's all good. But when I read it, the devil's in the detail. So there's a lot of stuff in there that we'll um, look at next. So, so far to date, We've um, got this new consultation, so it's uh, proposed, proposed amateur class license and considerations for high power operation. So it's two parts. There's the class license and operation at higher power. They're separate issues, but related, obviously, but they needed to be considered separately, really. And in the paper, it lists some 15 separate questions consultation questions, issues for comments. So there's 15 described questions. And they've also provided guidance for feedback based on their previous experience. So if you intend to, to respond, please look at the guidance and answer the questions. But there's nothing to stop you raising other issues because I think there are some other issues that need to be raised. Any questions so far? Okay. So there's some good outcomes, or at least probably good. Uh, the ACMA responded positively to a number of issues that were raised in the initial consultation. Uh, standard licensees get access to six, to, uh, six meters, uh, parts of six, well, basically uh, 50 to whatever it is, 50 to 52, uh, which was previously restricted to advanced class licenses because that was still part of the uh, broadcasting service, Band 1 VHF TV, but that went in 2013. However, it's still in the uh, spectrum plan, uh, 
as broadcasting. And conceivably, it could come back as they, they um, in some form, as they make a point of in the document. But for the meantime, it's allowed more amateurs to use that part of the spectrum, which is good. Uh, there was a number of other changes, particularly for geographic and bandwidth restrictions on some bands, most notably the 630 metre band, which had some strange restrictions, and they've been removed, so that's good. Uh, the thrust of the ACMA's main changes was to remove things that they considered as operational rather than related to spectrum management. So there's out of the many clauses in the original apparatus license relating to, for instance, linking to telecommunications networks, portable stations, club stations, a whole variety of stuff, it's all gone. We're now down to a very basic class licensing structure. And, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, so I think it's safe to assume that anything not prohibited is allowed. So <laughs> um, that's the way I look at it. And, and that, that's, that's a good outcome. It does simplify many things, and to have a simpler regulatory regime is, is good. However, there are some other outcomes which probably aren't so good. So there is now explicitly included in the class license a whole section, it's, it's pretty much the bulk of the document really, uh, about it's Schedule 1, and it's covering conditions about electromagnetic energy. And it's, it's quite detailed, it's very badly written, and I'm hoping we can uh, change some of that in terms, to make it a bit more understandable. You've got to read forward, read backwards, and it, it's, it's a, I find it hard to, to read in terms of a, and get the, the picture of what they're talking about. And so we have to be aware that compliance with the electromagnetic exposure standards is going to be more complicated. It's potentially expensive if you're wanting to go for a higher power uh, license. And it's likely to impact all of us in some way, all of our amateur operations. So that's something I'll talk about in a bit more detail. The other thing that some people are unhappy about is move the move to a, a um, class license basically means that we disappear from the, the register of radio communication licenses. So you won't be able to go to the ACMA website and look up a call sign. The ACMA is proposing that uh, that's not part of their core spectrum management activities and therefore could be or should be uh, provided by the amateur service or the amateur community. And Well, not for the uh, register of licenses like we have now. Well, call signs is a separate issue. So rather than the register of licenses, so if, if I, you know, if I hear a station on the air and I don't know who it is, I can go to the, the RRL and look up their details. Um, and that's separate to the issuing of call signs. And, you know, that, that's the next thing that I was going to mention here. There's now new text, quite a lot of text, uh, regulatory text about issuing call signs and the maintenance of, of um, the number of call signs by a third party, the AMC in this case. So there are some outcomes which we might consider aren't so good. Let's move on. The big ticket item, I believe, is EME compliance for most operators. We might be affected by call sign issues uh, at various times in our uh, amateur lives, but this will affect probably us uh, in a bigger way. Now, it's not really new, so while it's explicitly in the text of the class license, we have had, in one form or another, for some time, a, an obligation to comply with EME regulations. So the way we've been exposed to that in the past is by this document here, um, Radio Communications License Conditions Apparatus License Determination 2015. So that is a separate document to our amateur license condition de determination and it covers basically any apparatus license of which the amateur license currently is. And it specifies all sorts of uh, things for compliance with electromagnetic exposure. So it's not new, 
but it's now very explicit. It's in our face. It's in our license conditions. So we can't ignore it. It's just Schedule 1, and as I said, it's, it's a big chunk of the document. And what it does, it pretty much takes the text more or less directly from that from the first document and puts it in there. Some small changes, but, but nothing significant. And in essence, it divides all of our operations into low risk uh, versus higher risk based on some uh, criteria, nominal criteria. And so we have to address that in particular, look at our station and how we comply with it. So it's things like separation distances, uh, power levels, antenna heights, etc. They're the sort of things that we'll have to consider. What is strange though, and it's probably because the text in Schedule 1 has been taken from another document, it starts 10 megahertz. <laughs> um, and there's there's five bands below 10 megahertz, so that's one issue that needs to be addressed in whatever the final document looks at. I don't know what the intent is for bands like 40, 80, 160, 630, and 2200 metres, how that's going to be dealt with as part of this. Because I know, for the lower bands at least, there are, will be some issues in terms of the near field um, distances that uh, will cause us some grief, potentially. So the draft uh, class license refers to an as standard. You can get that. It's not too hard to read uh, compared to some Arpanza standards. So it's this document here. And you can download that from the web. And really, there's, in here, there's just two tables. We have to comply for the low, for the, uh, the low risk stations. There's really two tables. There's table four and table seven. And they specify things like the incident field strength and the incident or for both electric and magnetic field, um, yeah, electric and magnetic fields, and a power density for the higher bands. So that's you need to be, need to be aware of that. It, it's it's not too hard to read. Uh, well, it does. Yes, the draft the draft license actually covers that, um, and it says that somewhere here um, the clause also applies to an amateur station and is a mobile station for which the average power blah 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 blah. So they've got that covered. Yep, yep. Uh, that's a good question. My understanding is that we wouldn't be classed as an occupational level, more as an aware user. Uh, and my understanding is that we all become under general public, the general public classification because, you know, your, your, your family, your neighbours, whatever, uh, the delivery person, the postman, whatever, they're the general public and potentially exposed. So my understanding is, from reading this, that we have to... Yeah. Yeah, the general public exposure levels. Now, of concern is there are no, of those 15 questions, not one of them covers the EME issue. So if you want to raise that, and I think there are some things that do need to be raised, that has to be addressed outside of those questions, and I think there are some legitimate questions we need answers to. Uh, so I've said, this, it's carrying on here, the our Panda standard is free. The Australian relevant Australian standard AS 2772.2-2016 is not free. It's like three hundred dollars, and uh, it's it's a complicated thing. But that's the standard which tells you the basic method for assessment, the the way you would assess a a station. Fortunately, for a level one compliance the low risk, you don't actually have to go that far. Um, there's, there's some, uh, provided you've got a certain level of power, below a certain amount of power, antenna height, uh, public can't get access to things, you'll be okay. But if you want to operate more than 100 watts, it could be expensive, uh, complicated, and time consuming, <laughs> and uh, generally 
generally quite a task, particularly if you're in suburbia. So as I said, there's the low risk stations. Here, here are the things, the criteria. Uh, the power supplied, less than 100 watts, it's inaccessible to the members of the public, um, or the antenna, the base of the antenna is 10 metres above ground, and the blah, 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 blah. Um, that's all fairly clear and probably will meet most people, most people will be able to comply to it. We need to consider at a compliance assessment by the operator, you need to keep some records. I've done that. It's pretty straightforward. And there's some calculators you can get. There's the VK3UM calculator. The RSGB has one. Even the ACMA has got a pretty basic one. So I'm fairly comfortable with that. I mean, it's a nuisance, but it's, it's not impossible. It doesn't put us off the air. Yeah, that needs some clarity. <laughs> but that's the way I would interpret it, average power at a certain time interval. Yeah. So. So what are the lowest antenna antenna stations? So these two meters above ground that's all all the Well there's an awe there. <laughs> yeah. So there's an or so if if the general public can't get at the base of your antenna, it doesn't have to be above ten meters. So, so if you have it in your front yard, yeah, if you have it in your front yard, you've got a problem. Uh, if it's in the backyard behind a gate that's locked, then you probably don't have a problem. Yep, yep. So it's not ideal and. But it's not new either. You know, this has been here for, for some years at least. So we probably, if we weren't aware of it before, I mean, I was certainly aware of it, but, you know, it, was <laughs> it wasn't in our face. It is in our face now. Yeah, that's that sort of regulatory approach. So a high-risk station is a bit different much more complicated. There's a whole list of standards and as I said, 20, AS 2772.2 is expensive. You can get it. Uh, you might even be able to get it at a library, I don't know. Um, I've got it, but courtesy of my employer. And so there's uh, the various standards. Now, some of it is a bit unclear because some of it applies to sort of legacy situations that go way back to 2003. Uh, and so it's a bit unclear why there's all of this when I actually think an, a, a submission I would make was that we just go for one standard and forget all the rest. It's, it's, it's well, International Electro -techn Electro Technical Commission, so they're, they're global, but they're, I mean, as far as I can tell, they're actually quite close to 2772 with some subtle variations. But the, really the worst thing about this is that basically if it's fixed for your station if you if you go for your, if it if you want to go for high power you can't change the antenna you can't you can hardly change anything and that really is that that's that's bad and i think that needs to be uh, addressed so aside from incurring significant cost it really does fix the station to a particular state which, in my view, goes against any sort of station, you know, ex any sort of experimentation or or adjustments, which is really part of the amateur service. It's part of the reason for the amateur service. You know, we're there to technically experiment and, and educate ourselves and all of that. So, fixing it for that compliance basically means that we're stuck in terms of fulfilling other parts of the, you know the amateur service or the definition of the amateur service anyway. Sorry, if you want, if you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's because of its its origin is in that other um, apparatus license that I indicated. So. Uh, 
uh, well, anything that doesn't comply with the, the other one. So, you know, if, if, if it falls under, if it doesn't fall into the low risk category, it's high risk, therefore you've got to go through this. So it's, it's just a binary decision. Graham. That certainly for the low risk station, and that's the intent. The high risk one, the way I read the standard and the understanding, is that you have to go through a formal assessment following the procedures laid out in AS 2772, preferably by a, a professional in that area, like a third party agent. Uh, it's 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 really complicated. I wasn't going to go there. I think I'll just. just <laughs> But these are the issues with it, so these are the points that have to be made. So, you know, I'm, I'm just letting you know this is what's in there. We need to argue against it, and because it doesn't. I think that's quite a good suggestion and you know we've got a lot of knowledge here perhaps even some people who are doing who who professionally understand do it as professionally and, and and that might be something that either a local club could do or you know a state-based group or even the WIA so they'd be the sort of things I'd, I'd be be trying to arrange if we could. I don't know about that, but that, that's, that would be the worst outcome. That would certainly be the worst outcome. And it, it doesn't say that you have to have a third party assessment, but you have to at least do it in terms of the, the, lice, of the, the standard. So that would imply certain things. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, Graham. Uh, probably. Um, I did mention the RSGB calculator, uh, which is it's actually not too bad. That's at least for it, it's a multi-step thing, and with similar license, with similar uh, breakpoints to what we have in terms of. Uh, it it does. It perhaps doesn't do that as well as it should. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't looked at that. No, I haven't looked at that, so I don't know. Uh, but I mean, I, they're the sort of th tools we'll have to to consider.
Okay. Yeah. I'm coming to that. <laughs> coming to that. Anyway, I just I just want to alert you to this that you need to consider it if you've got if you feel strongly about it, then you know raise it with the ACMA. Don't let it slip because when it's there it's gonna be really hard to change. So the only chance we've got to modify it is now. So getting on to the next question. As already mentioned, there's a proposal to particularly for EME stations or Earth Moon Earth stations as opposed to electro. <laughs> um, I wish they didn't pick EME for electromagnetic exposure. Anyway, um, the proposal from the ACMA is that anyone who wants to operate high power, say for moon bounce, that they will uh, have to get a scientific license, scientific class license. Okay, that's currently six hundred and six dollars per year. And you could get it renewed, but you still have to comply with the exposure limits anyway, the, the um, RF exposure limits. However, I think it falls into a really difficult regulatory area because it becomes inter-service communications. You know, an amateur station wouldn't normally talk to, say, a, a, you know, a ship operator, a, a station operating in the maritime service or the aeronautical service or any number of other services, certainly not the broadcasting service. So I don't know why something that's licensed under a scientific class license in fact, would be an amateur station. Would that contact be valid from the amateur point of view? I don't know. It's unclear. It's, it's very unclear. So this is be certainly a question I'm going to ask. It sounds like a, a strange proposal to me. They just don't seem to understand that you know, EME is bouncing signals off the moon, but you're not just listening for your own echoes. You actually want to communicate with somebody, and therefore a scientific class license isn't appropriate. And so that's something that I think needs to be addressed in any response, because it's very unclear how that's going to, aside from the expense and everything else, how it's actually going to fit into the definition of the amateur service. Yeah. That's right. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, it's there. We have to um, deal with it. So, high-powered operation two. So, in the medium term, they're proposing that they accept, to some extent, that there's a need or interest in amateurs, typical amateur stations operating at higher power than their current level. And there's a whole, there's a number of questions, quite a few questions actually. Uh, ten, questions 10 through 15 of that document deal with this issue. And you know whether you think it should be related to specific bands or specific applications or specific times, there's a whole lot of questions they ask. So if you're interested in that aspect, I urge you to look at the document and answer the questions accordingly and make your submission. Uh, because it's a, it'll be an issue. And you recall that some years ago there was a high power trial, uh, which the WIA was successful in getting going. That that. That failed largely because most of the operators running at high power were completely unaware or disinterested in their obligations uh, regarding the exposure limitations. So if we don't have any success in getting high power operation, you have to be very aware of your EM, your electromagnetic exposure obligations and you know comply with the regulations, or the, the standards. But it's there, it's something that you need to, to think about. Another big issue is call sign administrations. Uh, call sign administration. So there's a lot of changes. It's again it's a substantial part of the draft proposal. It talks about, you know, the call sign entity. Um, and it's, it's quite a big section of the the document. Much more uh, encompassing than what was in the apparatus license. So you might want to look at that. I won't make any particular comments on that, but it's quite complicated and I know there's some strongly held views on the whole business. I don't have any particularly strong views on that. I've got my call sign. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of people who might want to change call signs, have multiple call signs. It's all rolled into that. There may be some limitations on the number of call signs you can hold. Uh, one particularly interesting clause is the prospect of this regular check by the call sign entity 
to make sure the call sign is still in use because there's some concern that we'll run out of call signs. Uh, however, no details are provided about how that might work, uh, whether it'll be fee for service or how often it'll be. Uh, I don't know. Um, again, Yeah, well, it, hmm. so, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's some questions you need to consider. Questions two through five of the consultation document. Graham. Well, they haven't died, basically. <laughs> they haven't died, basically. Um, or, or have lost interest or are no longer using it for whatever reason. So somebody might decide. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, not sure why. Why did? Well, the current issue of call signs, you can keep the call sign alive. Yep. And the only thing you have to do if you move into the state is let them, is let them know yeah. a change of address. Yep. The call sign doesn't change. No, that's right. Yep. Yep. Unless, of course, you happen to have a VK0 and it's a vanity call sign. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, it's, it's more complicated than what we ha currently have. It's bound to be more difficult and possibly more expensive. But uh, read the document. As I say, I don't have any particularly strong views on that. Uh, and, but I know people who do, and it does need to be addressed. As I mentioned before, this is the loss of the ACMA license register. As I indicated, we change from an apparatus license to a class license. We disappear from the ACMA uh, radio communications register of licenses. So you won't be able to go and look up somebody, see if they're licensed or if the call signs, you know, in use, whatever. And they propose, the ACMA proposes that the, it's not, well, they say it's not part of their spectrum management um, duties. Maybe, maybe not. But that the existing, that we should be able to use existing voluntary registers and, and obviously the one that speaks to my mind is qrz.com. I mean, I use that occasionally if I want to look up somebody. Uh, maybe we could set up, you know, there's, there's all sorts of options there, but it looks like something we're going to have to deal with if we, if we want to have that f uh, facility to continue. Oh, potentially, but... Yeah, so... Sorry? <laughs> well, unless you're interfering with the safety of life service or, you know, somebody who pays a lot of money for the spectrum. No. Well, if we can implement something similar, um, that would be good. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a question on that. 
uh, what you think about the need for that and how it might work, Graham. Yeah, it's two separate things, yes. Mm. Well, that, that would be perfectly sensible. So you can go and look up what call signs are free. So the corollary of that is what call signs aren't free. And um, sorry, the well, I mean, as I said, if if we know what call signs are free, then we know which ones are allocated, and so that seems to be a you know an extension of what exists already. But I don't know if if they we could do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, th that's quite clear. So. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, if you think it's important, make some comments on it. And if you've got an old, you know, a suggestion that you could make about how it might work, then I guess make a comment on that too. So it's one of the many issues that we need to think about. So other matters. Um, reciprocal licensing. So currently, if somebody comes into Australia, they can use their existing, their overseas license prefix by VK for 90 days. The, the class license will change that to 365 days, which is good. However, after that time, and, and again, there's some issues of reciprocal licensing. If, if somebody comes in with an overseas license that's, say, equivalent to the advanced license, even if that's recognised, they still have to get an AOCP. So they'll have to be re-examined to get an Australian uh, Operator certificate of proficiency. So that, in my view, at least, goes against some of the uh, intent of reciprocal licensing. We're still going to have three, three, three levels. There'll be the foundation, standard, and advanced. But the class license just means that we we're not an apparatus license. And the converse of that is if we want to operate overseas. Uh, we, there may be some issues, and it's the ACMA is in the consultation document at least address some of this by saying that uh, we can write to the ACMA and they'll provide us the necessary documentation so that you can go to a CEPT country or probably other countries too to get to allow you to operate overseas. So um, there's a question there, question seven, if you see any issues with that, uh, I, I've not done it. Uh, and and I probably won't, but if you if you do go overseas and want to operate, then you need to, with, with you using your Australian licence under a, some sort of reciprocal arrangement, you need to look at that section as well and make your response accordingly. There's a whole section on amateur operating procedures. This was a big part of the initial response to the first consultation. Basically, the ACMA washes their hands and say, if it's not spectrum management, we don't care. We don't care if you don't use the NATO phonetic alphabet. We don't care if you... Um, there's a whole lot of things they don't care about. They think it's operational and should be organised by the amateur service. OK, I, that's probably not unreasonable. And if you go back three or four years in the old standard, 
you weren't allowed to talk about religion, swear, or talk about politics. Yep. That's disappearing. Yep, yep. They're not interested. They're not interested. So, you know, they, they don't want to have any part of that. If you think that's important, then, um, you know, again, it's something that you might want to comment on. Uh, I don't know how big an issue it is. I, I do know there's some bad behaviour on air. However, I suspect that having operating procedures won't change that bad behaviour. So, uh, people will ignore it anyway. And so, on that basis, perhaps we're better off without it. But, again, it's, it's a big part of that, it's a, it's a substantial part of the, the, the um, discussion document, so you need to be aware of it. So, summary. There's both good and bad parts of the proposal. There's a significant reduction in what they call regulatory burden, which could be good for us. Well, there's much more complicated arrangements for uh, RF exposure compliance, call sign administration and high power operation. So they are three areas where things get much more comp potentially much more complicated for us. And we need to think, we, we need to try and get some of those things changed if we can. And so it's important that we make appropriate representation. And there's other changes, the loss of the, radio, the um, register of licenses and you know the changes to reciprocal licensing, which may affect you depending upon your circumstances and whether you've got particular views on that. Uh, you need to be aware of them because they may affect you what you want to do in the future. And whatever, the bottom line is, these changes will have profound impact on the way we go about uh, using amateur radio, on the amateur service, the amateur and amateur satellite services. There'll be profound impact. So you need to have our say. Now, the WIA, as um, the largest representative body in the country, has established a working group. I'm on that working group. There's a whole, there's about six or seven experienced people. So far, we've met three times, and we've made very good progress on identifying all the issues. Some of that is, some of what I've told you tonight is from that process. Uh, the views I've expressed here are mine, as I said. They don't necessarily come from the ACMA. They align in places, but they're, they're different than others. So we, there's the, the plan is to produce what we call an exposure draft of the WIA response for that to be be exposed to the amateur service, um, you know, the, the amateurs, licensed amateurs in the country through a poll and to seek people's view on that. At times quite short, this is all going to happen quite quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure to get this done. But what is important is that you need to make your views known one way or another. So. Uh, as soon as it's ready. <laughs> uh, that is my understanding, but there's, that's not a, um, a universal view. Uh, but uh, that's what happened last time. So, anyway, you can you can make your own submission per the uh, document. But note the comments. In the uh, beginning of the document, there's a section, so guidance on providing feedback. Look at that, they've got the 15 that. questions, and address those and other things. They don't want 800 identical responses. That just, you know, they're saying it makes work for them. Well, well it does, but that's what they're there for. So I don't have a great deal of sympathy for that view, but, um, at least try and, and, and comply with their, their requirements. The, the quicker, uh, I guess, if there are fewer but more succinct and well thought out uh, proposals, then we've probably got a better chance of making uh, positive changes than if there's 800 or 1,000 responses with, with um, that are all the same or, or, or don't make any sense. So, sorry? Well, I think so. I think they have to under the legislation. So, so I, I, you know, despite what you think of them, I think they're trying to do their job. 
and do their job properly. What they interpret their job properly is probably differently to what we interpret it as, but I, I think they're they're doing the best they can. So you know, I, I wouldn't be critical of them about that. But as I said, it's important to think about the issues, have your say, however you decide to do it. Submissions close 29th of November, so we've got just over a month, a lot to, to go through. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions? I mean, about the compliance of an EV, Bill made the statement that someone might complain. How do they know that we aren't compli being compliant? The only way they know is if we were causing interference. No. 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 <laughs> or, how, how would someone know? When I've got the case the is made and it's accepted. No, but how would someone else say that you're not compliant? They don't need to. They are the past. So they won't be up. Takes a little bit of and the staff might not be seen. Complains to the minister, and the next thing you're ordered. The first thing that happened with that, we did re uh, refer to planning. Because that would be more than you think. It's a problem from my boss. <laughs> and on my children are being around the end when I walk past your house. So we give them two hats. And next thing you're on the back foot. Yeah, I mean, interference and compliance are two different things. You could be interfering with somebody and be perfectly compliant. And vice versa, you could be, you know, non compliant and not interfering. Um, so, yeah, they're two separate things. And I don't know, this is all new territory. I don't know if it's ever been tested. Yeah, I, I just don't know. So, Andrew. Well, the working, yeah. The working group is well aware of that issue, and there was a lot of discussion about it. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about it last night. I, you know, it's aspirational because there's a lot to get through, resources are limited. Um, the WI will make some response. Ideally, you'll have comment opportunity to comment on that. Uh, that is the aim. And we should make our own response. The club could consider, as it did last time. And I think that's that's a perfectly legitimate and reasonable thing to do. So I, I think that's something that you might consider, uh, figuring out what are the important issues, what are the, the glaring problems in the proposal. I've pointed out some, so you might want to look at it and, and make a response. I think having a club response would be very good. And the more, more responses like that, uh, the more weight the, uh, they'll carry, and hopefully the more likelihood we have of getting a, a satisfactory outcome. So that's a summary. Uh, if, if you have any particular views, you can email me. I can, I can submit them to the working group. Uh, but it would be good if it came from the grassroots, from the, the individuals and, and um, clubs, as well as from the, from the representative body. So. <laughs> that hasn't changed. No, that hasn't changed. No, because that, that's, that's really a, that, that is a spectrum management issue. <laughs> so no, there's no change there. Okay, well thanks for listening. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, and uh,